Hey, to all the real estate professionals out there, I want to let you know The Buyer's Mind is sponsored by Homebridge Financial. Homebridge loan officers are experts in new home financing, and they bring sales ideas and strategies and market intelligence and programs that will help sell homes. To learn more about that, go to builder.homebridge.com. Homebridge Financial, home financing made easy. Hey, how consistent are you? And does it really matter? Let's talk about it on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Hey, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of The Buyer's Mind. I'm Jeff Shore, your host, where we talk about all things related to that purchase decision, including what goes on in the mind of a salesperson. And that's where we're going to go today. A little different turn in the buyer's mind as we look at salespeople, what makes them successful, and sometimes what keeps them from being successful. Joined, as always, by our show producer, Mr. Paul Murphy. And Murphy, just to start a question for you, how consistent are you in your life in general? Do you consider yourself to be a consistent person? I I am inconsistent. I have to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I've been yeah. uh, working really hard. I just joined a gym. And uh, even this morning, I woke up early and was going to go and uh, it was snowing. So I said, nope, not not going out. Just for the record, if it was snowing, it would keep me from going out. I just so so I don't want to uh, affirm your lack of discipline there, sir. But uh, you're, you're a nice hockey guy. You just skate there. What's the problem? Yeah, exactly. But I don't have to get through snow to get to the ice. That's the that's the big difference there. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, today we're going to have George Campbell on the program and we're going to talk about this thing called consistency. And it's a it's a subject that I've been studying myself over the last several years because I recognize I am like you, Murph, in that category where I would not consider consider myself to be a naturally consistent guy. That is that it. these are things that I have to work on. But George Campbell is going to take a different take on this, because if if you're an instant gratification person like I am, how do you use that uh, to your advantage? It's an excellent conversation from a really fascinating guy. Let's get into it with George Campbell. All right. Well, hey, listen, this will be fun. I'm looking forward to having uh, George Campbell on the podcast here for a, a while now. Uh, uh, certainly a, a legend in the world of uh, not just speaking and humor, uh, but also uh, just his real passion here in regards to consistency and what that looks like. And and I was looking at it and thinking, man, for, for sales professionals, the need for consistency, not just for their own a professional approach for how they can uh, be as productive and effective as they can be. But in regards to the way that they take care of customers is so critical. I know for me, I'm looking uh, forward to this because I recognize that uh, there are a lot of people who know me well, who would not suggest that consistency is Jeff Shore's uh, strong suit. So uh, I, I'm looking to get a lot out of this. Uh, welcome the great George Campbell. George, how you doing, sir? Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> you're you're uh, c- calling in from uh, Arizona uh, today, where you've lived uh, uh, for many years. Uh, you've got a just a really, really interesting background to bring us to this point. Can you give us sort of the Reader's Digest version? Well, uh, 10 years of stand-up comedy, survived the battlegrounds of that, and learned how to speak uh, to audiences that, that of varying degrees of interest in what I had to say. And then I made a segue into the world of professional speaking. I came up with a concept that was uh, was titled Joe Malarkey, the worst motivational speaker in America. Mm -hmm. And it took me about a year to write it and about Mm -hmm. six months to perfect it. And then it kind of took off like a rocket ship. It was exactly the right program for the right time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was a fun, fun ride for about 20 years. You're in the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, you would walk down the halls at an NSA convention and people would yell, you know, hey, Joe, say something hilarious. <laughs> uh, that that had to be a tremendous amount of pressure on you. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the other thing is I'm naturally uh, fairly introverted. So mm-hmm. I don't do well in the, in the best of those situations and people mm-hmm. yelling at me and want me to perform like a monkey that you throw coins at. Yeah. Uh, that, that was not the best thing. No. Sure. Yeah. It's really interesting that too, that the, you, you and I have met with known a whole lot of speakers in 
uh, our past, and we would look at it, and I think the mo- most people would look at it and say, well, they're a public speaker. They, they don't have an introversion bone in their body. And yet people like you and me and so many others who are very, very comfortable on the stage still uh, oftentimes profound introverts. And even at the NSA conference, you know, I see people, you know, shaking hands and hugging and everything else. I'm like, oh, this isn't that sweet. I think I'm going to go to my hotel room now and answer emails. Uh, it, <laughs> It's it's an interesting, weird thing, isn't it? People don't understand it a lot of the time. Oh my God, I, I would go to NSA, and they, I, I can't. It's like three days long, I guess, or four days long, whatever it is. It's about nine days too long for me. Mm-hmm. And I would come <laughs> home from NSA, and I would have to be hospitalized. I just, yeah. I would use so much energy. They say the difference between introverts and extroverts is that extroverts draw energy from their interactions and mm-hmm. introverts expend energy. And boy, that certainly was the case for me. And then all through this process, you're looking in, you're saying, okay, one thing that, uh, again, you've, you've admitted to is to look at it and say, consistency would not have been a word that you would have uh, put in the repertoire of George Campbell, right? There, there was a need that you had to go on a journey yourself before you could become the expert that could help other people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I look back, I, I, I did a deep dive into what I was really interested in. I, I decided that I was going to leave malarkey behind mm-hmm. uh, a, probably about three years ago. And because I still thought it would be a great idea to earn money and eat, I thought yeah. well, maybe you had to do something else. Mm-hmm. So I looked around and, you know, they say that you, we teach most what we need to learn. And this challenge of consistency was something that had really uh, plagued me my whole life. Even when I look at malarkey, there were a lot of opportunities that if I had just uh, taken advantage of them and and pursued them in the way that would have mattered, uh, that could have been much bigger than it was. Because mm-hmm. I, hit a, I hit a plateau that was very comfortable and very lucrative. And it was and it was extremely easy at that point just to let everything just ride along. And uh, and there were a number of business opportunities that, that I've uh, explored that I just simply didn't do the day to day stuff that was going to make the thing succeed. And I and I wanted it. I wanted to do it, but I just couldn't get myself to do it. Right. And it was never it was never like, well, I'm never going to do this. It was always like, you know, that. I am going to do that. It's just that today is not a great day for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you kick it, you know, you kick it. T- well, the weekend, you can't do it on the weekend. That's crazy. And then Monday, sure. you can't do it because everybody's back to work. And, to- right. and so you just keep just keep keep kicking it down the calendar until eventually it goes away. And I thought, why is that? Why is it that smart, capable, sharp people can be completely aware of the few simple things that if they did them on a consistent basis would result in a much more positive life. Mm-hmm. And yet for some reason, they can't take those actions consistently. And so that's, that was kind of the, the overarching question. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to find some sort of an answer, uh, hopefully for everyone else, but I'm certainly going to find it for me. And, you know, I, th- I think I've kind of, took some data points that, that people were aware of, but hadn't really connected the dots. And when I started putting it together and really doing the research, I thought, oh my God, this really makes sense. And it works. Mm-hmm. That's the other nice thing. I right. went from someone who had never worked out his entire life to someone who, uh, just as a test case, I was the guinea pig. I, put, I, I was able to put together a string of 531 straight workout days. Hmm. And prior to this technique, that would have never happened. Well, you know, it's interesting as I'm listening to your story and I'm thinking about it from the perspective of salespeople who might be listening right now, who might be very great salespeople. They, they were very successful in the sense that, you know, they are regularly, uh, they're top performers, they're driving nice cars, it's going well. And yet, is their success become something of a hindrance as they recognize that, if you're not trying to figure out how to make your next mortgage payment, if you've got that, that's all taken care of and you're living a comfortable life and it's, it's all good. Then you, then it's a little easier to go in coast mode for those type of people. And I'm looking for the, at the journey that you went through and, you know, we, we've never discussed fees, but I'm guessing that there were times when 
in that Joe Malarkey character that you know, you were getting an offer here from an organization that says, you know, hey, we want you to come out here. And by the way, the conference is at, you know, the Ritz Carlton in, you know, YLA on Maui. And, you know, we need you for an hour and we're going to pay you $10,000. And you go, $10,000. And that's great until $10,000 isn't great anymore. And then pretty soon it's $15,000. That's great until it isn't great anymore. And you keep raising <laughs> your fee and you're making money and you're staying in nice places. And, and at some point, you're you are almost a victim of your own success because it's I don't want to say it's coming easy. That's not fair. It, there's still a lot of hard work that goes into it, but there the some of the basic fundamental disciplines that mean for a successful and meaningful life have gone away. That consistency is not there while you're sort of living out this this uh, this dream that is somehow unfulfilling. Uh, uh, look, I, I, I know I'm getting deeply philosophical and, and <laughs> along the way probably putting words in your mouth, but are you resonating? Is that is that sort of the way it worked? Well, I, I certainly know that there was a time where your whole framework has been, the, the way you view everything is so dramatically different than where you came from. And it's, and it's difficult, to, you know, it, it happens, it just kind of creeps up on you so that you, it's not something that's this gigantic thunderbolt of success that hits you. It just kind of mm -hmm. happens day by day. And, and, and it, I think about, because you're right. I, I, I was to be able to go to some of the places that I've been invited to go and somebody else is paying for it. Would you like a couple extra days? Cause you are in Hawaii. You might as well. And yeah, sure. here's this, here's more money than you ever made in three mm -hmm. months right. or four months in, in comedy. Mm -hmm. And, and then the, you hit that point in time where, well, that's just the way it is. And you just yeah. take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's funny. It's, it's tough to kind of get back that mindset. And I guess it maybe goes to appreciation and gratitude and everything else. But, mm -hmm. uh, Man, you can lose sight of the real world when you get sucked so tight in that vortex that yeah. Well, this is the you know this is the way things are. Yeah, that that's the way it is. I I, I get you know, huge applause. I get the recognition. I get the people in the hallway. I get a big check. I get to stay in in really really cool places. And by the way, is my life significant? Right, right. Yeah. And yeah. am I and am I doing what I'm really best at? I mean, what sure. happened yeah. for me was I got so locked into a performance. I got so locked into this show mm -hmm. that, and, and as the money went up, it was kind of a double-edged sword, although yeah. it's the best double-edged sword you could have. Sure. Right. Uh, but I felt like, wow, they're paying me this amount of money. Every joke has to land. Every, mm -hmm. every piece of material has to be a material. Yeah. A lot of and pressure you, right there. Yeah. When yeah. you get to that place, then you're reluctant to do the thing that's actually going to keep you there. You're mm -hmm. reluctant to bring in the new stuff that you're not sure of, mm -hmm. because man, I you know I I, I don't want to do stuff that's I, I where do you break in material? And so then you just wait, well I don't, yeah. And then you get out of the creative end of your business, and then it starts to get stale mm -hmm. because you've done right. this stuff so many times, and it's like I got away from doing the things that got me here, mm -hmm. and that. That kind of gets back to that consistency thing, or in this right. case, it gets back to just completely forsaking the things that uh, that were the really meaningful things that you got a lot of a lot of creative charge out of and a lot of enjoyment out of. But now it's like, you know, those those are no longer practical for us to do. So, it, is part of the issue with consistency that it's it, it's not necessarily uh, these are not necessarily earth shattering actions uh, that we're going to take in order to build this over a long period of time. And someone once said that which is easy to do is also easy not to do. And so after right. a while, it's just you're avoiding the very things that you know in the long run could make the difference because they're not necessarily dramatic or romantic or sexy. There, there are a lot of little things that need to be done uh, that are that are frankly fairly easy to ignore. Is that part of the problem? That is, if the things that I needed to do were, were neon lights in my face on a regular basis, maybe more inclined to do them. I don't I, I don't know. That's a it's an interesting question. Uh, because I think there are some really dramatic differences between people that are inclined towards consistency and people who are disinclined. Mm -hmm. And for like for the people that are inclined towards consistency, roughly 20% of the population, the big things, the neon lights, 
those those things are will attract draw and draw them and draw out consistent performance mm-hmm. and 80 percent of the population those big neon lights are you know they can be scary they can be seen as unrealistic or unbelievable and you just it's too big mm-hmm. and so then you have to break it down into the smaller components of that which gets like what you're talking about it's kind of the the day in day out uh nuts and bolts which are not that exciting but are going to get you there so it's, it's it's an interesting balance, and you have to have a strategy to deal with both ends of that. Let's talk about the 80 percent. We're, we're talking to George Campbell. He's You can find him on consistencychain.com. Uh, you download the app and a new book specifically for network marketing, but it goes much f- uh, further beyond that when it comes to consistency. And you talk about this concept of the 80 percenter. If you could just give us a definition of, of the 80 percenters and those people that are instead wired for the 20 percent. Sure. Well, I mean, the the difference between, I mean, we go back to the Pareto principle here, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, like 80% of a sales organization's sales are going to come from 20% of their salespeople. And it's shocking uh, how pervasive the 80-20 thing is. And so that was kind of where I began. And I was like, well, I understand this ratio, but I I don't understand how it could could apply so universally to people because people are so different. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at all the things that that the 80% uh, lesser achievers and the 20% high performers had in common and uh, intelligence, education, training is largely the same, even ambition. Mm-hmm. And so once you eliminate all the things they have in common, then to me, the the key differentiator was simply this, the 20% high performers do what needs to be done when it needs to be done on a relentlessly consistent basis. Mm-hmm. And the 80% who are, uh, I put myself in that category. We know what needs to be done, but we don't do it consistently. Mm -hmm. And that's the key differentiator. And there's a real reason, if I can give you just a little bit of backstory, because this really kind of makes us understandable how how we fall into these groups. So way back in the early 1970s, a, a research study was done. It's called famously called the marshmallow test. It was done at Stanford. Right. And they they gathered together 300 five year olds. And boy, that must have been a fun day. Sure. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> they brought them in one by one, set them mm-hmm. on a table, set, a, uh, set them at a table, put a marshmallow on the table. So listen, you can eat the marshmallow at any time, but I'm going to leave the room. And when I come back, if the marshmallow is still there, I'm going to give you a second marshmallow. And roughly 80 percent of the children ate the marshmallow. And I know what I would have done. I would have mm-hmm. totally eaten a marshmallow because I'm a grown man. I sure. Can't keep Ore- I can't keep Oreo cookies in my house. Right. So I know I'm a, my, an Oreo cookie at my house has a life expectancy of an insect in a fly, fly swatter factory. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. So uh, I identified heavily with this 80%. And, mm-hmm. and this has been talked about if you, around the speaking business. We've heard people speak about this all the time. But the most significant part of this has, has been overlooked. So what happened is they followed the kids through their life and they found that the 20% people, the 20% kids that were able to delay consistency in virtually every life metric excelled past the 80% who were driven by instant gratification. But the, the, but the really significant part of this study didn't come until the 2000s. I think it was 2011. They brought the subjects back, the original subjects, they brought them back and now we've we've reached a place where medical technology and computer uh, power have have reached a point where we can look inside a live human brain in real time mm-hmm. and a technician could look at the activity level in two different areas of the brain and tell you with 100 percent certainty whether or not that test subject did or did not eat the marshmallow hmm. 50 years prior so working backwards from where they are today you could have predicted what their inclination would have been when they were five that is exactly they they can they if if your uh prefrontal cortex lights up Mm -hmm. then guess what you won the consistency lottery Mm -hmm. because you're functioning in the part of the brain that has the ability to look at any action in the moment and project what the likely outcome of that action is going to be in the future that's the seat of consistency that's the seat of delayed gratification contrast that with me and 80% of the population who are hardwired, and I don't know when the hardwiring happens, at least by age five, as evidenced by this study, 
I work out of the ventral striatum, which is a much more primal part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And my decision is based on a completely different filter, which mm -hmm. is what we call the ESP filter. Is it easy? Is it safe? Mm -hmm. And is, is it pleasurable? And that's mm -hmm. the seed of instant gratification. When I'm right. when I want to lose weight, but I'm confronted with a donut, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the prefrontal cortex says no, that's not going to serve us well in the long term. Yeah. Whereas my my part of the brain goes, is it easy? My God, it's a donut. It's right there. How, there's nothing easier right. than that. Is it sure. safe? I love. You know, I've been mm -hmm. eating donuts forever. It's safe. Is yeah. it pleasurable? Oh my God, have you had a donut? Right. And, right. Yeah. And I make a completely different decision. Than, than the other uh, 20%. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the reason why, you know, when you're, it's the reason why 80% of the people don't work out. It's the reason why 80% of the people are a little to a way more overweight. It's, mm -hmm. It explains so much because we're fighting with a part of our brain that is not going to help us mm -hmm. in these long-term battles to build stuff over a period of time that we really want. And so we've got to find a way to to hack that system and it's and it's jeff obviously you've been around a bunch of speakers and and mm -hmm. a lot of what we hear in in motivational speak well first of all most of the most of the people on stage are 20 percenters i mean they mm -hmm. they did a right. lot of work to get there and they right. over a, a long of period sure. of time yeah. yeah, it's almost a it's it's almost a, a winnowing process that allows nothing but twenty percenters on stage, and so they share what worked for them, and then they say basically, do what I did, and I'm in the back of the room going, I would love to, but I can't, mm -hmm. I can't. I've I've tried it all, man. I've tried the goal setting. I've tried the affirmations. I've I've done that. I've got the vision boards. I've I've done all these things. I I don't know how many. I've got I've got Franklin planners piled up in my closet that the first mm -hmm. two weeks had ink in them, and the rest of them are pristine. Right. And I'm like, I start this stuff. I get it. I understand the importance of it. I just can't stick with it. And so, so what they're saying from stage is basically be more like me. And I'm saying mm -hmm. I can't. And they're, they're saying, deny your essential nature and be consistent. And that's, I've never found a way to make that work for me. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we did is in developing the, the book and the, the concept of the consistency chain, we basically say, listen, if you're an 80 percenter and you struggle with consistency, let's not fight that anymore because that's not working out well for us. Mm -hmm. trying to convince ourselves that we're something we're not is not a good long-term solution. Mm -hmm. So basically what we say is if we can't beat this desire for instant gratification, let's make it work for us. Hmm. Let's allow, let's, let's develop a tactic whereby our insatiable desire for instant gratification can actually help us take the daily steps that are going to lead to the long-term success mm -hmm. that we want. One of the things that you're talking about here is we are supposed to know what we are supposed to do. I mean, do we know in what areas we are supposed to be consistent? We just don't do it. Or is it a matter of not being able to identify what those things are? I mean, I think I could look at it and say for the longest time, I've used this example before on the, on the show, uh, I used to floss fr from time to time, meaning the, the day before a dentist appointment, of course. And so, you know, and now <laughs> right. it's just like I floss every day. I don't think about it. Now, I always tell that story in the form of just building good habits and how you build habits right. and what habits are. But uh, at, I first had to come to realize, you know, why that was important. Do you think that we know the things that we are supposed to do? Uh, or is it for some people a search of, well, what do you want to be consistent at? Well, it certainly could. I mean, it certainly could be a lack of knowledge for some people. I think for most it's it's that's really not the issue. Mm -hmm. I mean if if you're a salesperson, my guess is somebody's made it abundantly clear to you the things that you really need to do consistently. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to lose weight, you know, might want to look into the diet, might want to consider exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think we basically know on some level most of the things. I know personally it wasn't a lack of knowledge for me that was the issue. Mm -hmm. And if it were, if that, if you feel like that was the issue for you, then by, by all means, seek out somebody who can lay out for you what they've done. It just, uh, the way that they went about doing it may not work for you, but if you can nail down those activities, 
Um, it's for instance, we're working with a guy who is a a, a mortgage broker, and most of his business comes to him from referrals. And he knows that he needs to reach out to people and he's got a video platform to be able to do that, but he just wasn't doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and we helped him set up a a system whereby every day now he sends out two videos because he knows that's the key activity in order to drive referrals is going to fill his pipeline. Mm -hmm. And he went, he went from doing it, Every now and then, too. I think I checked. We, we we keep tabs on him. I think he's got. He's like a ninety-seven percent success right now. Mm-hmm. He shows up ninety-seven percent of the time. Well, that's huge. And it wasn't a knowledge issue that was holding him up. It was just like, well, yeah, it's Saturday. You don't really have to do this on Saturday, do you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 really uh, in a, in a a big sense, it's a mind game. And mm-hmm. somebody said to, to me, they said, well, this is just a mind game. And I said, well, where, where did you think this was going to be played? Uh, well, I think part of it is in the if it is a mind game and I think it is, then then you one of the issues you have to deal with is that you're talking about consistency. And I think it's not much of a jump for a lot of people to look at it and say, OK, that sounds like discipline. Right. I got to be disciplined. And to me, the word discipline itself comes off oftentimes as such an ugly word. Yeah. So how have you managed to, as you say, leverage the idea, the instant gratification uh, route. If I want to leverage that and make that work for me, uh, how do I do that when I'm when I'm when I'm in a big part of my mind is saying that sounds like discipline and discipline sounds like not fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I get that. So let me let me go back to the example of me deciding to work out uh, yeah. every day. So the first thing I did is I made uh, a kind of I set up a goal that violates every form of goal setting because I've done traditional goal setting didn't work out well for me. So Mm -hmm. instead of saying I will weigh 175 pounds by January one, I didn't do any of that. What I said was I'm going to be fitter. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be healthier. Mm -hmm. And then I went, I went to work out the first day and I came home and I could look myself in the mirror as any reasonable person would agree with me is after my workout, you know what I am? I'm fitter. Mm-hmm. I'm stronger. I'm healthier. I'm a little closer to that goal. And because of that, I could celebrate that. It was instant gratification. I won. It wasn't mm-hmm. some, so if I said, I'm going to work out every day for a year, when do you get to celebrate that? In mm-hmm. a year. Right. Plus I was, plus I would never celebrate it because I would never make a year. So what I had to pull it down to was I'm going to celebrate this moment today. And today is the only day I have to win. If you mm-hmm. asked me if I was going to work out tomorrow, I would say no. Yeah. Absolutely not. Because mm-hmm. I in 531 straight days, I never worked out tomorrow. Yeah. I just worked out today. That was the only day I had to win. And and so all the pressure's off me now. Yeah. And it became yeah. fun and it became easy and at some point it becomes a habit. I mean, I mm-hmm. I knew that uh things had changed for me and I don't know how many months it was in to this where you wake up and your decision is no longer, am I going to work out today? My decision is now, what workout am I going to do today? Mm-hmm. And what you know, right. one of them has a 50% failure rate and the other one has a 100% success rate. And it, and it was life, it was life changing because literally all the shame, you know, when you say I'm going to work out for you or I'm going to do anything, anything in your life that's a long-term thing. And then for 80% of the people, they don't do it. Uh, or they, you know, they quit after a little bit, or whatever it is. I mean, most uh, New Year's resolutions. Uh, I think the expiration date is February eighth. By mm-hmm. February eighth, right. virtually all right. New Year's resolutions are gone. And so yeah. then, what do you feel? You feel, and then the the the, the next year comes around. You're going to reset and know that you're going to go through that shame and that failure and that frustration again, or more likely, you're just going to say, you know what, I did it for five years in a row. It never worked out. I'm going to quit. I was just thinking about an application to this. I was, uh, I'm a big fan of Dan Sullivan, the founder of the strategic coach program. And one of the things that he says uh, uh, every day, he has three things on his to-do list every day. That's it. And when he works with entrepreneurs, he sees they start their day. They got 20 things on their to-do list. They know they're not going to do 20 things. They're not even going to do 10 things, but there are 20 things they put on the list. Then they only do seven and they feel like miserable failures. He will never put more than three things on his to-do list 
Because if he does four, he's a tremendous success. He exceeded all expectations along those lines, and he gets the instant gratification of having exceeded his goal. And I think the point is, and and this is what I wanted to say that's consistent with what I'm hearing from you, George, don't lose a game when you get to write your own rules. Come up with a game you could win, that you're mm-hmm. confident you can win. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I've got a partner in this business, and and he was in a network marketing company and he's the anti me. He's unbelievably been successful at everything he's ever done in his whole life and built gigantic organizations and built large traditional businesses and everything. And he, uh, for this network marketing company, which is where we met, uh, he had developed this thing called the daily eight scorecard, which was the eight things you need to do every day to be successful in this business. Mm -hmm. And after we started working together, I said, Jim, that was a really, uh, the, the daily eight scorecard was fantastic. I said, there's only really one issue with it. And that was it's seven too many. <laughs> but, because I could do, I may, I may even, I may do the most important thing I could do that day. Mm-hmm. But if the other six or the other seven are, are blank, how do I feel? Yeah. Right. I feel like yeah. a failure. And what did, and if I feel like a failure today and I did my best and, and I did the most important thing, but I feel like a failure at the end of it. What are the odds I'm going to play again tomorrow? Hey, listen, uh, we're out of time, but it's just such a fascinating conversation. Before we let you go, I got to put you on the hot seat. Some rapid fire questions, rapid fire Uh-oh. answers. You ready? Uh-oh. This is how Here I went we go. to prison. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Your very first job was what? Uh, I was a delivery. I was a drug dealer. My God, I delivered uh, prescriptions for a pharmacy. Love it. Okay. Uh, an album or artist from your youth that you listen to over and over again? Man, Steely Dan Asia. Mm-hmm. Can't argue there. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood? On the beach in Bora Bora on Christmas Day. Very nice. Uh, any book that you've read that's made a profound impact on your life? Atlas Shrugged. Mm-hmm. Uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, doesn't matter when it comes on, you have to watch it again. Man, there's two that I just right off the top of it. Shawshank Redemption is one yep. of them. The other is uh-huh. Zero Dark Thirty for some reason. Oh, great, both great movies. And finally, uh, your first celebrity crush. Oh, my God. I was 13 years old, and I saw The Seven Year Itch. And I never <laughs> understood. I never understood the appeal of Marilyn Monroe. I didn't get it. And then I saw The Seven Year Itch, and I thought... Oh I my get it. God, I, I get, get it. it. My life is now complete. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you're off the hot seat. Thank you very much. His name is George Campbell. The website is consistencychain.com. You can download his free app there and get his uh, book. Uh, again, it's for network marketing, but I think it's going to be appropriate for just about anybody. If you've been inspired by the conversation, that's the way to go. George, can't thank you enough. Thanks for being on The Buyer's Mind. You bet. What a pleasure. Okay, Murph. Well, there you have it. Really fascinating stuff from George Campbell. First of all, really interesting story, is it not? Yeah, fascinating to see how, you know, you you start out one way and then you have to figure out how to reinvent yourself. But even more importantly than that, I really related to a lot of the points he made about uh, being consistent in that 80-20 area that he kept uh, bringing up. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at the success of the people who live in that 20% zone uh, or or those 20 percenters who know what consistency looks like, it makes a big difference. But I also gained uh, uh, some confidence, Murph, in the idea that, okay, well, I might be a natural 80 percenter, but I do believe that I have it in me to be able to still be consistent in the areas that matter most, right? Absolutely, uh, because I, too, fall into that 80% category, uh, you know, the, the ESP, easy, safe, uh, pleasurable. I, I, yeah. I, you know, it was great to hear from him that I have hope, uh, and it was mm-hmm. it was a good conversation to have today. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, as we listen to what George Campbell had to say, and we, we sort of think through how we apply that to us, the one thing that I want to challenge all of you with, if you're a sales professional, if, you, if this is what you do, I just want to challenge you with the idea of consistency, not just for you, but consistency for your customer. That is, what are the things that you need to do consistently that will benefit your customer? Because it's easy for us to be able to look at it and say, well, this is what I need to do for me, and I'm not going to argue with you. You absolutely should. But there is the question of what should you do 
that's going to benefit your customer. And my opinion is that if we can figure that out, if we can look at it and say, this is the one thing that I can do every single day that would benefit my customer, that we'd get a little snowball effect uh, there. We'd, we'd gain some consistency momentum. And even as George Campbell was talking about it and saying, well, the problem with your list is of eight things is you got seven too many. Well, I agree with that. But what if you nailed that one, that one consistent thing you could do over and over again until it was such a habit that you didn't know how not to do it? Then you know what you could do? At another. I, I think the problem here is when we try and do everything at once to try and become somebody who we are not. But if I can look at it and say, what is that consistent thing that I can do that will benefit my customer? Maybe that's a good starting point. So let me just challenge you to spend a little time right now asking yourself the question, where can I practice consistency in a customer-related way, a way that my buyer will benefit from my consistency? What would that look like? Start there and move forward. You get that done and you get a little momentum going, you get a little, little confidence going, and then pretty soon you can start looking at how consistency plays in different pockets of your life. So there you go. Great conversation with George Campbell. Once again, thank you for listening, as always, to The Buyer's Mind. We would sure love it if you love any of the episode, this or any other. If you would post a link onto your social media page, it would mean the world to us as we continue to grow this podcast. Until next time, go out there and change someone's world. 